So I know after lunch can be a little sleepy, but I have to say um, I have really been enjoying this convocation um, and I appreciate how much the speakers have kept to the theme of story. Really grateful for that. And we're gonna continue that with our next plenary, the art of storytelling in everyday life. Now you've met a lot of outside speakers outside of SMU and Perkins. This plenary, we are highlighting two SMU uh, great people. Actually, I don't know about Will, whether he's great, but I do know that Alice is great. <laughs> and Alice vouches for Will, so it's all good. So let me introduce my friend, Reverend Dr. Alice McKenzie. And I say my friend because she really has been a friend to Jack and myself since we arrived two years ago. She is the Levan or Levan? LeVan, Professor of Preaching and Worship and the Director of the Perkins Center for Preaching Excellence. And those of you who preach on a regular basis, that's an incredible resource that Alice runs. Um, so please keep your eye out for that. She's written a lot. I won't uh, go through all of them. Um, but in 2015, she offered the Lyman Beecher Lectures at Yale Divinity School, and that's really a big deal. Um, so we're very proud of Alice. And she and Will have taught, Will Power, have taught um, a class together for our Perkins students. How lucky is that? Uh, Will is on faculty at the Meadows School of the Arts at SMU and is the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation playwright in residence with the Dallas Theater Center. Um, he has been in many, many plays, and I won't read them all. But I wanted to tell you that his, among his numerous awards uh, is a 2016 Doris Duke Artist Award, a United States Artist Prudential Fellowship, and the TCG Peter Zeisler Memorial Award. He's been on film and television, including the Stephen Colbert uh, Report, one of my favorite people. So. Will you please help me welcome Will Power and Alice McKenzie. This here is a story about Samuel Jackson Brown. He had two women, one on each side of the town. You can see where this is going. At Samuel's funeral, both of these women were there. One was cussing, crying, and carrying on. The other, a blank stare. One said to the other, sister, um, who is you? <laughs> the other said to one, I be Samuel's new. One said to the other, well, I be Samuel's true. And if Samuel was still alive, I'd beat him till they're black and blue. The other said to one, I'm with you. <laughs> now, Samuel Jackson Brown heard all this from the sky. He said, I'm sure glad I ain't between all of that. <laughs> and he let out a sigh. When all of a sudden, God came down from up high and said, Samuel Jackson Brown, you wasn't supposed to die. A mistake was made by your neighborhood saint. It isn't your time, Samuel said. The heck it ain't. <laughs> That's the end of that story. Thank you. <laughs> So, a good question to start with, and one that this gentleman has uh, excellent thoughts about, is what is a story anyway? We know it when we hear it, but what are some of the components, do you think? What is a story? <clears throat> a story is something we all know, but how to define it, right? Right. I would say a story is the retelling of an event, right? That's the first part. This event can be historical, it can be based on history, mm -hmm. it could be biblical, it could be mythological, it can be something that's imagined, right? But it's some kind of event that you're retelling, a, a retelling of an event with meaning. That's really key, with meaning. Mm -hmm. And I would say uh, meaning to get to the truth or a truth. And this is what I mean by that. So, you know, 
there's different truths that make one truth. So, for example, everybody knows Star Wars. You guys know Star Wars? The original, not, not the new stuff. Even though I like the new stuff, but like Luke Skywalker and uh, the Ewoks and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah. So, if you think about Star Wars, what is the meaning? What is the truth or what is a truth that that original trilogy brings forth? And I would argue it's that no matter the sins of the father, right, which was in this case was Darth Vader, no matter the sins of the father, no matter the, the evils brought forth from the father, the son or the daughter, the new generation, will always be able to rectify and make good the sins of those that came before, right? And that's the truth. That's the truth. So that's the meaning. That's the meaning. Um, if you contrast that with Oedipus, for example, Oedipus is almost the, the opposite of that. Oedipus says, no matter how virtuous the new generation, no matter how well-intentioned the sons and the daughters, the evils of the father and the mother will always drag them down. <laughs> you know what I mean? Always pull them back. And that is a truth, too. So I would say story is the retelling of an event with meaning that gets to the heart of a truth. Mm -hmm. And there's a number of components that we could, you know, talk about forever, but some basic ones are obviously conflict. So, like in the little ditty that I did for you there, there's a clear conflict, right? These two women discovered that they were, you know, that there was a, some infidelity going on, and the guy was up in heaven or somewhere, and then God was like, you got to go back. He's like, ah, you know? So that's a conflict, a point of tension between two irreconcilable forces, yeah? Um, there's usually some kind of resolution, not a solution, but a resolution. This one, I cheated a little bit on the resolution, but the tension was ended. Now, we don't know if God came back and said, nah, you got to go back. You know what I mean? We don't know. But uh, there's usually a conflict, a resolution. There's usually a character. What is a character? What is a character? Anybody? You want to shout out what a character is? You like the name of a character? Or no, what, what is, is a character? Like, what is a story? A person what? Person with a role in the story, that's good. Anybody else? That's good. So, yeah, person with a role in the story, I would say, which is kind of what you're saying, I would say a character is uh, a metaphor for a human being, hmm. you know? So you need to have characters. It's not necessarily a human being. It's a metaphor for a human being, which is why you can watch a cartoon and those are still characters, which is why you can watch, um, I'm, I'm aging myself here, but like Nature of Omaha or... You know, and, or March of the Penguins, you know. Like, March of the Penguins, those, the raw footage, those are not characters. They're just penguins just walking around. But the way that those filmmakers edit that, they show you those things that bring out the human attributes. Does it make any sense? You're seeing them, they're like, the mother protects the egg. You're like, oh, that reminds me of my mother protecting the egg. You know what I mean? He said, the father does this. That reminds me of me. So they bring out these empathetic connections, and the filmmaker turns these animals into characters. So that, that's kind of some of the basics of what yeah. a story is. And, and the final thing I would say, and there's, a, there's more to this, but just the basic stuff is like there needs to be stakes involved. Like I always tell people, if you're trying to have a story, even if you're trying to push for a positive ending, make sure you send your, your protagonist through a lot of hoops. Don't make it easy. Right. You know, and when I work, because I, I work with a lot of like preachers and religious um, folks as well. It's like make sure if you want to get to the good stuff, make sure it's really difficult to get there. Because I feel like we're cheating our audiences if it's like, yes, and then he said no to drugs, the end. You know what I mean? It's like, well, what were those real, what were those real stakes? What were those real difficult choices to get to that place, right? Heaven forbid we see someone on the street who's homeless or addicted to drugs. That's not an easy thing. They just didn't just get there. There's a journey there and probably some really critical decisions of that moment where they were like, I'm giving up or whatever. So, like, get to the, the heart of that, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So that's kind of a little bit about what what a story is, you right. know? Um, yeah. So for preachers, I think that's a really important question. And it's one that Will and I have done a lot of talking. Uh, when did we start working together? Like three years ago? Something like that. Yeah. yeah. And I had heard somebody gave me his name. And it only occurred to me later that Willpower is like Willpower. That's a cool name. That really is your name. Yeah. So, uh, so I called him and uh, I think Maria Dixon maybe told me that uh, he might be somebody that would be helpful in my classes. So we... Um, you guest taught in my class, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. then we um, decided to teach a class uh, last spring. And uh, this, um, this spring, on I think it's April the 18th or the 15th, whatever's a Wednesday, uh, we're offering a continuing education event called The Preacher and the Playwright. And mm -hmm. uh, we are actually going to write a book together. We have a publisher now, Westminster John Knox Press is going to publish the book. 
So we're going to um, offer the workshop, and it'll be an opportunity for those who come to help us. Mm -hmm. so we'll have some ideas and <coughs> some thoughts, and but you'll actually get to help us um, get our book kind of rolling. Can, can I say something real yeah, quick on please. that? Um, just not to digress too much, but it's interesting because when, when Alice and I started to work together, there's so many things about what we do, me as a storyteller primarily in the secular world and you in the theological world, right. that's similar, but there are differences, you know, and what I told her is that theater, I mean, storytelling is as old as, I don't know how old it is, very it's pretty old. old, but theater as a, as, a, as, a, as a form, as a structure really came about in, in ancient Greek society, you know, and it's kind of like when the Greeks started to question, they started to question um, God, they started to question, you know, was this what it was? And so some people feel like that was man or human beings' um, enlightenment, and some people feel like that was our downfall. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. So it was the moment we were like, does God exist? And does God exist? Does he or she have our best interests in mind? So the Greeks really started to question that, and theater was created right at that crux. So we have a faith base, I think it's faith based, but it, it also sometimes questions whether human beings will make it or will, whether they not. Mm -hmm. It seems like you, you guys' thing is kind of oftentimes on the up. It's a positive. Right. We have that, but we also have sometimes it's like it's all going, to, it's all going down to the two. So it's interesting. It's similar, but it's kind of different. Right. So why stories? Why stories? Why stories, yeah. yeah. Why, why do we need to tell stories? Why is it important in well, this day and uh, age? There's, um, there are theories about that. And um, one of them, uh, well, let me start. Why don't we start with the biblical reason, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That'd be a good place to start. Bible stories, <coughs> right? We're taught them as children. Sometimes we're taught them in a very harmless way, like Zacchaeus and uh, Jonah. But these are actually um, stories for adults, aren't they? So the Bible is just rife with stories. The whole, st the whole um, creation, fall, redemption, mm -hmm. recreation is a big story, which actually the culture is not buying necessarily from us at this point. So we got to hone our storytelling skills. So there are biblical reasons, uh, theological reasons. Mm -hmm. I was intrigued by, uh, I'm working on uh, a book called uh, Making a Scene in the Pulpit, and I was intrigued to learn in looking at some of the background to the Gospel of John, the prologue, when it says uh, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The, the word is skene, skenao, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is um, the word we get our word scene from. Mm -hmm. And uh, it used to be the uh, actors, it was a booth where the actors would change. And then it became kind of more general to the whole backdrop of the scene and then the whole scene itself. So, so uh, the word became flesh and made a scene uh, among us. So um, it's very incarnational uh, from mm -hmm. a Christian perspective to preach in story. So there's biblical, theological, what else? Um, well, anthropological. Mm -hmm. and we, we talked some about this. Mm -hmm. There's a book called The Storytelling Animal by Jonathan Gottschall. Anybody heard of this book? It's not a preaching textbook, but read it anyway. <laughs> it's um, very provocative, but he's, he's an English professor, and he was driving home one time, mm -hmm and he heard Chuck Wick's Stealing Cinderella uh, come on the radio. And it's about a, a young man who's come to ask for um, um, a man's daughter's hand in marriage. Mm -hmm. And the father leaves him in the um, parlor or the living room uh, to go get his daughter, and he has time to look at all these pictures mm -hmm. of the dad and the little girl and the mother uh, as, she, as she grows up, running through the sprinkler and riding her bicycle. and. Uh, so Jonathan Gottschall has a young daughter himself, and he said he just, he was listening to this song, and not a particularly emotive guy, he says, but he began to weep, <laughs> this is so sad, this is so sweet, and he had to pull his car over uh, and wait until the emotional tide had swept over him. And he started thinking, he's a literary scholar and a scholar of evolution, and he started thinking, why was I so moved by that mm -hmm. story? And out of that comes this book, that's called The Storytelling Animal, How Stories Make Us Human. And his theory is that stories, that, that um, cultural groups that could tell stories survived better mm -hmm. than those who couldn't. Mm -hmm. And that, um, that stories are kind of like an ethical simulation booth to try on, uh, well, like try on how it would be to be in certain situations, like with Hamlet. How mm -hmm. would it be, do I have this right? Mm -hmm. How would it be if uh, my uncle killed my father and wanted to bury mm -hmm. my mother. Mm -hmm. Anybody understand? And happen to anybody out here? <laughs> no. Uh, but there's some archetypal <laughs> situations, I guess. Uh, and mm -hmm. how would it be? So we we enter into the story. We identify with what you say, a character, mm -hmm. and then um, we 
are in some way transformed. Would that be what happens in a play? I think so. As well? I think so. I think the, the, the great playwright Edward Albee, who just passed away a few years ago, someone asked him, why are the arts important? And um, I would, I'm, I'm going to use what he said for storytelling specifically, like why are the arts important? And he said, because the arts, and I'm saying storytelling, define civilization. You know? So it doesn't say that it makes civilization, but it defines it. So if you have no storytelling, you have no, no arts, you have no definition of who you are, of, of reclaiming what came before, what's going, lessons learned, all those kind of things, you know? Um, I also just want to say, I also think like a couple of things. One, it's really critical. There's all kind of storytelling now. Like there's, you know, there's Twitter storytelling and there's online, you know. But I feel like the, it's, it's, it's so important then that we continue to tell stories in the live arena as a forum for people to gather in the flesh, you mm. know? Um, it's not that this form of storytelling is better than telling stories over Facebook or Instagram, but it's like we need all of it, I feel like, to express our true human humanity. And one of my concerns is that, like, if we continue to get so technological, you know, what happens if we start losing the ability to kind of communicate live in the flesh? Hmm. And that's pretty scary, you know, um, because we, 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 we gain so much from being amongst each other as, as a species, you know? So I think there's, it's critical not just other kinds of like online storytelling or, you know, digital storytelling, but the idea of like a town hall, a public gathering space. That's what theater is supposed to be. And I, don't, I can't speak as much for preaching, but it's not supposed to be just you go see a show and you get in your car and you leave. Sometimes it is that, but it's supposed to be you see a show and then afterwards you flow out into a restaurant or a bar in the lobby and you talk amongst each other. You know what I mean? That's really a key. And so like theaters and public spaces for storytelling, in my opinion, need to have gathering spaces that are architecturally designed that foster and encourage people to talk about what they heard mm -hmm. in the flesh. Because mm -hmm. if you don't, it's not fully doing its thing, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing really quick is what, it, what you gain as a storyteller. So that piece I just told Samuel Jackson Brown is, you know, is based on like, you know, some stuff that, my, you know, he was like my father, my stepfather, you know what I mean? And uh, I, I created it in the, in the, uh, in kind of like a kind of so-called Negro folklore style. But, you know, it was kind of tragic in my family, not to get all personal, but it was also funny too. You know, it was not the funeral, but it was at the, he was at his, on his deathbed in the hospital. And someone was crying and his my mother was like, who was that other woman? It was pretty funny. It was terrible. It was tragic, you know. But it's funny, too. It's like, so it's like sometimes storytelling allows you to look at stuff, that the tragic stuff, but also the humor in it. And then also to heal. Like, uh, not all of my stories are based on uh, my own life, but a lot of them are. Some of them are. And oftentimes it's a thing to also heal and a therapeutic thing. To hopefully to kind of spark something in you, but also as a, ther a therapy thing for me. Right. That's why storytelling is important right. to me. And you have, that's why you need time to talk about it with other people. Yeah, absolutely. So, so when, you, when, when you talk about uh, live storytelling, live theater, and a time for dialogue, then I'm thinking about, well, how does that relate to preaching? Which, mm -hmm. in the classic sense, is what? Monologue, or at least in that form, in a lot of white mainline preaching. And that was one of the main critiques of um, propositional, you know, three-point preaching. You all come, I'm going to tell you three things about God, and if you can go home and... Uh, repeat my main point over lunch, then you got it. You don't really need to discuss it with anyone because I told you, I, I, I told you, so just what, what she said. So the critique of that was it was, it was predictable and, mm -hmm. and there, it was monological. Uh, and then there was all sorts, you know, with the 60s and the 70s, the questioning of authority, then like, who are you to tell me three things about God? Mm -hmm. So kind of moved toward more story and more um, inductive and also a... Um, well, you know, the African-American traditions have always had the mm -hmm. call and response. So you've mm -hmm. got a verbal sort of, you know, so if I'm not doing well, it's helper Lord, right? And there, mm -hmm. are, other, there are other cues uh, that there's that an actual uh, physical and sonic evidence of a dialogue. Uh, but I think for all preaching, <coughs> there, there should be a dialogue in that the preacher knows the congregation. Mm -hmm. And uh, Fred Craddock calls it empathic imagination. What's it like to be you? I'm looking randomly at different people. What's it like to be you? What's it like to be you? I know you, and so I, I can incorporate your questions, perhaps, and your uh, needs in my message. So there's a sort of integral dialogue. But I think there's been a movement toward more of what you're saying, actually having time for a dialogue mm -hmm. with, with um, people. I have a, a colleague who's working on it. She calls it a sermon, dialogue, sermon, method for preaching on difficult topics. Mm -hmm. So she offers a message, 
then she offers several opportunities for people to dialogue, and then she incorporates their insights into a sermon on the same topic, mm -hmm. uh, which is, she says, is very effective. Uh, she's working with a group of young women clergy in Louisiana uh, who are in congregations who are more, less progressive than they are. So it's mm -hmm. kind of a way to really hear it's really cool. what they're saying. I want to I want to touch touch on something you said about the preacher as a as a, as monologue. Right. Um, it's it, for me like I work with a lot of you know a lot of students and some are really into specializing. They want to be a playwright but not a performer. They want to be a director and I do kind of all, all all of it. But but I really I really value if it's meant if it's if it's in your trajectory. I really value if you can as an artist come and perform and inspire and entertain by yourself on a stage, mm. you know? So whether that's the preacher, whether it's the stand-up comic, I don't mean someone telling lewd jokes, I mean like stand-up comics that really, it's, you know, like Richard Pryor or Dave Chappelle or, you know, Seinfeld, it's really a storytelling, you know, George Carlin's an evening, you know, of mm -hmm. work. Um, you know, the way I came up was, I did a lot of stuff as an ensemble when I was younger, but when I, the way I started to become nationally known is I started doing solo shows. Mm. And so I like what you're saying about the preacher knowing their community and telling stories. So I would know my community, and then I had all these stories about my community, and I started to take them on the road. Um, it kind of like, almost like a, a, a neighborhood diplomat, you know what I mean? And I would take all these stories of these characters that I grew up with to these different places in the country, and then I went to Europe and Africa, just all over the place. And it was fascinating because a lot of times, these other communities that, that were thousands of miles away, if you're doing your job right, they can still see themselves in your stories. Mm -hmm. So it's good to talk to your community, but it's also a powerful thing to also connect those archetypes to other communities. And that was a really a learning experience mm -hmm. for me. People mm -hmm. were like, I know that character. I'm like, but we're in Botswana. How can mm -hmm. you, you know? Right. They were like, you know, but I'm, we're in Australia. He's like, yeah, but that's just like such and such. That's just like such and such. Right. So it's also about like being that kind of ambassador for your community when you go out. And that's my thing. You should, you don't have to, not, it's not for everybody, but like, that's a powerful thing. Like, I've n I never got a chance to see Michael Jackson perform. Mm. I know there was a lot of tech and lights and, the, the, you, know, uh, you know, it was a big, big production. But I'm sure Michael Jackson, if he was still like, he could come out on the stage and entertain for an hour. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Ain't that, I'm just, I'm not going to yeah. do it. You know, just kill it. You know? Can you dance? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, <laughs> not like that. I'm okay, but not like that. But you know what I mean? So, 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 and that's my thing. That's my thing. Like, you know, all the extra stuff is good. The lights, the camera, all the, you know, the singers. The, but it, so one woman or man can come on stage and tell a story for an hour, an hour and a half. That's the base of it. So what you're talking about is going back to Homer and it's going back yeah. to, you okay. know, West African griots. It's going back mm -hmm. to the original. I'm not saying it's better than having like a play or a pageant, but I think it's back to some of the original roots. You can have roots. both. You can right. have both. Right. It's definitely right. back to its original roots. Right. And for me, that's what it was, because sometimes now I do stuff that has, you know, bigger budgets and production, but back then it was like I had my costumes in one hand, I sent the light plot ahead, and, you know, when we got fancy, I would go with a road manager or a tech manager, but a lot of times it was just, just me sometimes going around, at least the first couple of years. Yeah. Um, and that was a powerful thing to be like, wow, I can provide an evening, me and, and the crea you know, creative, mm -hmm. creative spirit, obviously, for an evening just me. You know, yeah. That was a very validating thing. Mm -hmm. Well, um, there's a book by Doug Paget, who is the pastor at Solomon's Porch in Minneapolis. And I can't remember the name of the book. It has a black cover, if that would help you find it on your... Uh, but at any rate, um, it's basically about how we don't need the one person on the, on, in the pulpit anymore that we sit on the couch and we have a dialogue sermon. So I read this and I thought, oh my God, I'm a dinosaur. <laughs> Nobody needs me anymore. <laughs> and then uh, as, as uh, luck would have it, the next week I was, went and did a preaching thing in, uh, at Lake Junaluska for their, it was a week of um, teenagers and um, music directors mm -hmm. uh, that they have every year. So it's me and like a thousand people in their, you know, their big outdoor, what do you call those, Arbor not arboretums, but Amphitheater, that's it, starts with an A. And uh, I went and I stood up in front of everybody and looked out at all their faces and I thought, you know what, Doug Patchett, your couch is fine, but this calls for, this calls for something else. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a, there's a valid role for, um, for both of those. Mm -hmm. and, and one other thing about why story is that there's a theory out there, uh, I mentioned about the storytelling animal, remember? And that theory is based on the, the um, belief that we are all hardwired mm -hmm. to try and make connections between the disparate events in our daily lives. So it doesn't end up just being like, uh, like Lemony Snicket, a series of unfortunate incidents, right? 
Um, the author of that book says that life is like a restaurant where um, they, all kinds of weird waiters bring you items that you didn't order and do not like. <laughs> so there's got to be something beyond that, doesn't there? So, but the idea is that some people would say we are hardwired for story. Other people would say that now that we have the, the handheld devices that you all have, yeah. that we can actually successfully be nowhere simultaneously. Right? We've always yearned to be two places at once. Well, now you can be nowhere simultaneously because you're here, but you're not here. Mm -hmm. You're checking this or you're connecting with this. Uh, and so their idea is that people have lost their narrative chops and um, <coughs> that they're just moving from episode to episode. So I would say this all the more reason to connect them with a bigger story. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we need, we need anyway, in my opinion, we need all of it. We need the old, the now, and tomorrow. We need all of it, yeah. you know? Like, um, my son was showing me these, like, vines, is that what it's called? Yeah. Like, and they're, like, little, I mean, it was so fast. Each one was, like, five seconds. Like, blah, 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 blah. It was just, like, very hard to watch. But each one had its own kind of narrative. But literally, it was, like, five seconds. Like, what are you doing? Oh, what's up? I was like, let's go. Ah, boom. That was it. Like, it was just a quick type kind of thing. So right. I think, like, people are still telling stories. They're still into the narrative. But it's, yeah, you don't want to lose the, the, the ability to be present. That's right. really tricky. Yeah. That's when really tricky. When we get to the part about where we're, how to tell a story, I think yeah. we ought to emphasize that because that's crucial. Yeah. That's crucial. So um, people love commercials, right? My husband will say, not everybody, but some of them. My husband will say, yo, you got to see this. And I'll say, I don't have time for that. You know, I'm cleaning and I'll come in and sit down and we'll watch. And I'll say, oh, well, let me see that again. Because they're little narratives, aren't they? Mm -hmm. they're, uh, they're little narratives. Um, have you seen the one where the guy comes in and replaces the Buckingham Palace uh, guard? Yeah. Yes. It's hilarious, right? I watched it twice. I'm more shallow than the rest of you. Everybody's like, no, we don't watch television at all, right? Stories okay. everywhere. You can judge me. But um, w the why of story, I, I think stories are more important than ever now in a technological age. I would say so. Yeah. And they exist in the technological age. You yeah. Know? They, lift, they, li they, they exist on that platform, too. Yeah. Um, so do we want to switch it's to fascinating. Why, where are stories found? Where are stories found? Where are stories found? Hmm. Mm -hmm. hmm. You want to go first or you want me to? Um, we both have ideas about where stories are found. I can go first. I can do another. Can I do another piece? Because I think sure. I can show it. Yeah, yeah, I can show it. And um, but You do a piece and then I'll ask you questions. Okay, yeah. How yeah. Because it, it, might sh it might be a better way to show, not tell. And I think... Um, and then I have one too, so we'll have like a. This is not. Why don't like you a, go first? No, you, you go first. No, no, okay. you, yeah, you All go right. first. Well, yeah, yeah. Okay. So um, before that, though, I, I would say, um, and I did a workshop on this earlier, but but stories are found in our inner lives, which I call the inscape, mm. which I thought I invented that word, but actually the romantic poet Ger Gerard Manley Hopkins invited invented that, right? Inscape. Okay. Have some Hopkins fans out there. Um, so there's the inscape which is a rich source of story. Uh, I was once doing a workshop with a group of young Baptist preachers, and I, I started with Inscape, and I said, I'd like at you, you at your round tables to discuss some of the um, plots that are now going on in your inner life. And they looked at me like, what? <laughs> inner life? I thought we were supposed to start with the Bible. Right? There's no connection, right? So the Inscape... Right? And then we find stories in the landscape or life around us and mm -hmm. what's going on, uh, overheard conversations, uh, experiences other people share with us. And what's the other one? The textscape, which probably should mm -hmm. come first. Mm -hmm. A lot of sermons begin by uh, attentiveness to some detail within the world of the text. And ignoring the text and just writing roughshod is called proof texting, and it's a great time saver. You can laugh. <laughs> but it's an uh, insult to the congregation. So inscape, textscape, landscape. And, and then I would also add that stories are often found in adversity. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. think? Absolutely. Right. So, um, so I have one from, um, you, you could call it, uh, maybe call it trauma on the train or whatever you want to call it. So a number of years ago, my husband and I went to Germany and I was attending a meeting called The Renewal of Preaching in Wittenberg, Germany, appropriately, home of Martin Luther. And uh, I, on the way there, we were driving through Germany, we stopped at Rotenburg. Anybody heard of Rotenburg? Beautiful, walled city. And we're doing a kind of twilight tour. 
And, and I'm watching the people walking in line ahead of me, and I thought, what an interesting pair of pants that woman has on. They were white, and they had these flashing blue and pink lights on them. And I thought, what an interesting German fashion. And, and then my, my left eye started to have sort of a, a darkness coming down. And I went home and looked on, uh, what's the thing, medical, what's the MD? WebMD. And apparently it was a torn retina, right? It was tearing. And so uh, that's another story, but I had it stapled by a lovely uh, German doctor. I asked him what caused it, and he said, I am sorry, but it is aging. <laughs> so my husband had to leave early to go, to go home, uh, but he got me a ticket on a train. I had to get from Wittenberg to Frankfurt to fly home. And uh, so, so I practiced. I practiced with my little German dictionary what I needed to say for someone to help me with my suitcase. And I needed to say, I just had eye surgery. I cannot lift heavy things. Can you help me? So I got on the train, dragged my suitcase up, and uh, this very efficient woman came up to me, and I said to her, my eyes are very heavy. Can you lift them? <laughs> and uh, I, she said, she looked at my ticket and she said, oh, you're in the wrong place, follow me. So she began walking uh, up the aisle and I'm dragging my suitcase, bumping it over irritated German people's feet. Uh, my dear husband had bought me a ticket in first class compartment and so she took me to the end of the, of the train and we were, showed me into a compartment. She said, these girls will help you. And I was in a compartment with these two young girls, uh, Anna and Heidi. And they were probably 19 years old, and they were on their way to um, America to be au pairs in, in California. And they were so excited to be able to practice their English. So they asked me all kinds of questions. I gave them my card in case things didn't go well in their au pair situation. Uh, and they, uh, we had a delightful conversation. And um, my high anxiety at being in a foreign country with limited German skills began to sort of just kind of melt away. Uh, and we came to where we had to change trains, and they led the nice American lady onto the, the next train and sat with me. And finally, we came to Frankfurt, where I was to stay at the airport Hilton, right on the property. Mm. And we got off of the train, and, and uh, you know, you don't always know if you should hug a stranger mm. or not. But I said, may, may I hug you? And they said, okay. And I reached over, and one by one, I, I hugged them. And the reason that I hugged them was because I wanted to show my appreciation for their help. But the real reason was I wanted to just feel right on their upper shoulder blades for the wings that were hidden beneath their coats. So do you want to go next? So, so story are, stories are often found in times of adversity, uh, I think. Do you? Yeah, absolutely. That's kind of a personal story. There are whole, um, whole peoples that have stories that are forged out of adversity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll do, so I'll do my final one. And then well, it might do, not be final. You know, well, we might do, make you do I another one. But I'm going to do it just to, and I don't usually deconstruct it this way, but just I'll do it and then we can talk about it. Okay. I think it speaks to where our story is found, okay. right? Okay, all right. So this is a story that I, I created about my grandmother. I want to share with you. How many of y'all love your grandma? Raise your hand if you love your grandma. How about both hands? Put both hands in. The, the, uh, okay, good. All right. So this is about my grandma. And uh, she passed away a while ago, but, you know, she lives on. Keeps going on. So this is this is about her. This is for her and for all y'all grandmas too. And this is called My Grandma's Feet. It goes like this. <clears throat> My grandma had them feet to ah. My grandma had them feet to ah. My grandma had them feet to ah. Them life completing feet to ah. And when she walk in the house, make room on the couch, and you finna hear a treat to ah. Gather round now, take a seat to ah. My grandma had them feet to ah. Them rusty, dusty feet to ah. Them down south feet to ah. Them Bible reading feet to ah. Them quiet, 
praying feet. Do I them demonstrating feet? Do I? My grandma had them feet. Do I? Them long walking feet. Do I? And when she got on the bus, never caused a fuss. No seats moved to the back just like us, but not check. Don't you ever try and disrespect. Grab a white man tight by the back of his neck. She said, what you call me now? Well, that man turned white like a sheet, ha! But grandma had them feet, do I? Them call Uncle Harry feet, do I? Them train riding feet, do I? Them way out west feet, do I? Them last hired feet, do I? Them first fired feet, do I? Them gotta be a better way feet. Lord, them gotta be a better way feet, do I? Gonna start me a business feet, do I? Gonna own me a home feet, do I? My grandma had them feet, do I? I say my grandma had them feet, do I? And when she walked down the aisle, everyone smiled. Mr. Mrs., they were married for a while. But after, well now, Jimmy, that was my fifth child. I found out my husband, he had another woman and another child across town. Get out. No, 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 no. You, you get out of my house now. And I never married again. Oh, I had my share of male companions after that. <laughs> Don't y'all get me wrong. I'm just telling y'all, I never married again. Them truth be told feet do I. Them getting old feet do I. Them grandmother feet do I. Them great grandmother feet do I. My grandma had them feet do I. Them jambalaya feet do I. Them cookie baking feet do I. Them Jesus jumping feet do I. Them hell no feet do I. Them not so pretty feet do I. My grandma had them feet do I. Them medicine making feet do I. Them herb boiling feet do I. Them come here. Here, honey, feet do I? Them strong black woman feet do I? Them beautiful feet, Lord. My grandma had them feet do I? I say my grandma had them feet do I? I then grandma had them feet do I? I then grandma had them feet do I? I then grandma had them feet. All right, thank y'all. <laughs> so thank you. So I want to do that piece because this idea of, of where our story's from, you know, where our story's found. So I was on a train uh, when I was living in New York, maybe about, I don't know, 50, 20, about 20 years ago now, a long time ago, 15 years, something, way back in the day. And it was around the end of the day, about 6.30, and I was coming uptown. I was living in Harlem at the time. We were coming up from Midtown. And there was this woman. I think she was Latina. I think she was like Afro-Latina maybe. I don't know. And she was, I assume she was coming from like a hard day's work. She just looked really tired. She was like maybe like in her 50s, and she took off her, her shoes. She took off her shoes. And she had the most ugly feet, but they were also the most beautiful feet. You know, like they were like beat up. Like you could tell, it, just, it seemed like she just hadn't been on those feet working years. And so she was like, she started rubbing her feet. And they were, just, they were just really just beat up and just worked. Just, you know, but just so beautiful. And so at that time I saw that, it sparked this idea of like, I started thinking about my grandmother. I was like, grandma's feet, it just came to me, you know. And it came as a sound. like, And then it kind of built out of that, you know. And so, for example, I had two grandmothers and my stepfather's mother. So I really had three grandmothers. So it's kind of like a combination of two of them, yeah? So as a storyteller, sometimes you can kind of pull from different experiences and put together. And those experiences that I talk about, the migration from the south to the west and then the infidelity, and all that, it's like a combination of two of their experiences, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so sometimes you'll see something, you'll hear something, you'll experience something, and it may not be a story yet, but it becomes a story in a, it becomes a part of a story later. The, the, um, the grandmother grab, my grandmother grabbing his, the, the guy by the neck after he, he um, insulted him, that was a situation when I was in high school, years before I saw the woman's feet, and I was with a friend of mine, and my friend brought this other guy. I ain't like the guy too much. I know who this guy was. He was, he was, he, I don't know what, he wasn't African-American, he was another ethnicity, whatever. He was cool, but he was kind of weird. We were on the bus, 
And I grew up in San Francisco. San Francisco is, you know, you walk everywhere and it's very crowded. So I was on the bus and it was packed. And so we were kind of like, if you imagine the front of the bus here and people were like still holding this way, people were holding this way. And this old woman got on the bus. She was this old African-American woman. She was really old. And she got on. I don't know why someone did not stand up to give her a seat in the front, but they didn't. They didn't. And so she was making her way to the back of the bus with a cane, like really old. And she passed by this guy that my friend had brought along. And she was just trying to get by. And he was like... He was like, he was like, you know, watch it, B, and he called her a B word, right? I was like, and before we could do anything, she whirled around and she just, she grabbed him by the neck. Like, what you call me? And it was like she had the strength of God. I mean, it was just like, it was, I mean, she just like, and she went from like, I mean, like superhero. And, and he was like, I didn't mean you, I didn't mean you, ma'am, you know. And we just, we teased and insulted him all day. I mean, it was just a... He just, he just he didn't hear the end of his life. But it was, so it wasn't my grandmother that did that. But I, it was this, this thing that I remember that happened when this guy insulted this old woman. And before any of us could jump in, she just she defended herself. And literally, I mean, I mean, he was just in pain. Like she just, I mean, it was powerful. I'd never seen anything like that. So all of a sudden, years later, when I was doing, I saw that this woman massaging her feet, that then became a part of the story, you know. Huh. So it's kind of like... You don't know where you can find stories. You can find them anywhere. You can find them in the quietest place, in the loudest place. And the joy sometimes is putting different things together organically to, to make a tale. Yeah. So, and yeah. you can make them up, right? Yep. So can I give a quick example? So um, you know how when um, preachers preach, sometimes people's minds wander. I've heard that that happens. I don't know. <laughs> Not when any of you preachers preach, but other preachers beyond this room. So um, I was listening to this old preacher one time, and he was talking about death's vehicle. And he said, everybody's death has its vehicle. For some people, it's, for some people, it's uh, murder. For some people, it's cancer. For some people, it's old age. But everybody's death has its vehicle. And at that point, I don't know why, my mind went off on a scenic <laughs> tangent. And I pictured myself in our home in Allen, Texas. We have this big combined living room, dining room. And all my family is there. Everybody, Uncle Jim, Aunt Lucy, Uncle, Uncle Horace, Aunt Louise, Uncle Bill, Aunt Catherine, Martin and Clyde, all of our cousins and all the kids. And, and we're having a big meal. And um, somebody says, says uh, Aunt Alice, there's a, a limo just pulled up at the curb. And we have you know, the windows beside the door. And he, he said, there's a limo out there. It looks like an airport limo. And I, I turned to everybody and said, Did, I thought you all were staying until tomorrow. Did somebody decide they wanted to, who's, who's got the airport limo? Did somebody call the airport limo? Uncle Jim, Aunt, Aunt Lucy, Uncle Bill, Aunt Catherine? No, no. Clyde, Martin? No. And I went over to the, the window and I looked out. And a driver had gotten out and was holding a sign. And they even put the Y in Alice. And I looked, and I, I thought, well, I'm not planning to go anywhere today. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and even if I were, I mean, how do I know how many days we're going? Three or seven? How many pairs of shoes do I need? What's the climate? And, and then I came back just as the old preacher was finishing his sermon. And he said, everybody's death has its vehicle, friends. And the trick is to have your faith tank all filled up when your vehicle pulls up at the curb. Mm, 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 mm. So you can make them up. Mm. And, and yours is like a, a collage, mm -hmm. right, yeah, of, that of one different was a collage. experiences. It's so exactly. I just think that, um, that mm. any for preachers, and I don't know about for playwrights, probably that too, um, any... I encourage all quirky thinking as long as it's moral and legal. <laughs> Any quirky thought. Isn't it Flannery O'Connor says, tell the truth, but tell it slant. And I'm, I'm so interested in your, uh, Will has done uh, two, uh, pl many, many plays, but the two that really focus around an actual mm -hmm. historical character, one on Cassius Clay and one on Stagger Lee. Yeah, well, Would yeah. you just say a little word about, about that? Because what he does, has anybody read anything by Eric Larson? who does that, he kind of goes back and finds a historical setting. He writes um, actual uh, historical kind of stuff, but it's not really historical fiction. 
So it seems like what you've done is find historical figures and then allow stories to kind of craft around them. Yeah, like the what ifs. That, well, you yeah. know, so I had this piece, um, one of my more, uh, one of my pieces has more done a lot more than right. some others. It's done a lot. So it's basically about the true but little known friendship between Muhammad Ali and this guy named Stephen Fetchett. I don't know if you guys know who Stephen Fetchett is. He was like an old actor, um, you know, the first African-American uh, actor to be a millionaire. And he played this, this stereotypical kind of stereotype of a lazy black man. You know, and his plan was, his real name was Lincoln Perry, and his plan was to go to Hollywood and break in with that character and then become an actor to do other roles. But because he was good at that character and also because it was, Hollywood was so racist at the time, they never let him play something else. So he always played like this bumbling fool. So his thing was like, how do I like put some, some, you know, some trickery into that, you know? So some people looked at it like he was like a, a stereotypical uh, black man, like a, a, a stereotype. And other people were like, well, he's like putting one on over old master, you know? Because they were like, why don't you go work? He's like, what? What is work? What? You know, so some people look at it as like an insult. Some people look like he's being smart. But anyway, by the 1960s, he, he became an outcast. Both African-Americans and Caucasian-Americans were embarrassed by this emblem of what America had been on film. But in this weird time, you know, him and Muhammad Ali, who seemed like he was the antithesis of Step and Fetch, it became friends. And the crazy thing for me was, as a young kid, I grew up in the you know, post-civil rights, you know, I, you know, a lot of my parents were like activists and in the Black Panthers and SNCC and all this kind of stuff. So I learned about Snap and Fetcher like he was the Antichrist. i never forget, you know, his bro brother, brother Kenyatta was like, that's the Antichrist, brothers. Was just, you know, it was just very like, so I was like, okay, that's, that's the traitor to our race. And then Muhammad Ali was like our hero. And so many years later when I saw this picture, it was a picture that set me off, and I saw them together, I was like, what are those two doing together? It's almost like if, I don't know what it would be, like, the devil, and I don't know what it would be, like something that seems like totally opposite, and they're together. And Stephen Fetch, usually he's all like lazy, but in this, he's like, like, I'm like, he looks serious. You know, who is this guy? And so it set me into a journey to find out what was the truth about their friendship. So that was that one. And then Stagger Lee, you guys know the old song, Stagger Lee? Stag the night was clear. Yeah, Stagger Lee. Yeah, so I got into these like really like, you know, I did, I've done a lot of stuff around Greek myths. And so I started thinking about like, what are American myths? And the closest thing I could think of was, well, one was like Superman, Batman, Spider-Man. <laughs> but the other thing was like these old folk tales, Stagger Lee, John Henry, you know, um, Frankie and Johnny. You know, these old, I was like, that's about the closest we have to like an American mythology. And who's Stagger Lee for anybody that doesn't Stagger know? Stagger Lee was the baddest man on the planet. He was, the, he was a big bad man. He was a terrifying figure. That he, he, long time ago, he shot a guy over a hat. But he was also a figure in the African-American community that was like, he wouldn't take any stuff from the police or from, like, the Ku Klux Klan. Like, the story was like, you know, he beat up the Klan and had the Klan running. And we don't know if that's true or not, but, you know. So he's a bad man. You don't, like, he's not someone you want to necessarily invite into your house. But it's someone you like. He's someone who doesn't take anything from racists. You know what I mean? So he's kind of like this complex figure, you know. Um, so I did this piece about these folk tales, and I had the folk tales move through time. Because in every era, there's a Stagger Lee. In every world, there's a Stagger Lee, or a Frankie and Johnny, or a, or a John Henry, or, you know, whatever. So that was fun because it was a musical. So I also, me and a friend of mine composed the music. And so, like, they were in, like, 1930s Harlem. Then it jumped to, like, 1950s Chicago. And then the music changed, you know. It's kind of cool. So the characters continued on their narrative arc. But the time changed and the place changed. And they weren't aware that it was changing time and changing That's place. Cool. And so they were, they were kind of, it's, like, it's basically about, like, African-American migration and the search of all Americans for the American dream. <laughs> does the American dream exist? Who does it exist for? You know, how elusive is it? So it explored those kind of things. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And Stagley was based on a real person who, you know, got into this fight in a bar back in 1905 in St. Louis. And it was such a crazy fight that they were like, man, that guy, he killed somebody. He killed two people. He killed ten people, you know. And by the end, it was like, you know, he, was, you know, he went down this. And one story was like he went down to the hell and beat up the devil, kicked the devil out. Another one, the guy he killed, the wife came and got Stagger Lee for revenge. And all these stories came out. But why that was is because it happened in St. Louis. And in St. Louis at the time, it was right on the Mississippi River. 
So you had all these boats going from St. Louis down to Louisiana, uh, New Orleans. And then you had a lot of people going out west. They would stop in St. Louis. That was their last stop before they went into the hinterland. So something happens in St. Louis, a lot of these stories would travel. So that's so just a couple kinda, of things. Kind of like a snowball rolling down yeah, the hill. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm always interested in sometimes, like, part of what I'm interested in sometimes, like, these new, older stories and how do you make them new? Right. How do you bring new relevance that to That sounds them? like preaching, doesn't right, it? Right, Biblical stories yeah. and how to... Yeah. Uh, my, yeah. Uh, my mother... Um, is now 87, and um, she has dementia, which is unfortunate. But a few years ago, she said to me, she said, I feel sorry for you. I thought, okay. <laughs> there could be many reasons she might say that. Uh, <laughs> but she said, um, I feel sorry for you because you have, to s uh, you have to spend your time trying to make that old, tired book come alive for people. And I thought, wow. She said, you know, I've been going to church so many years. She said, and I've just gotten tired of the Bible. I thought, wow, I wonder if that's a testimony to, uh, to preaching. Uh, Tom Long uh, says, uh, he says that whenever he hears someone say, you know, we need to have a Bible study or we need sermons that will make the Bible come alive for people, he pictures a group of people forcing an elderly relative to dance at a family reunion. <laughs> so the Bible is alive. Maybe we're the ones that uh, need to... Hmm need to not kill it, mm, right? Mm, but I like this parallel between bringing old stories, bringing old stories to life today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. something there. So we want to shift then. Did you have should something we, else you no, want to say? No, should we do questions? What time well, is it? Well, let's see. I think we're good. Let's talk just for a few Second. moments okay. uh, about how our stories told, okay? Uh, and so um, one thing I would say is um, something called concrete significant detail, which we talked about in our workshop. I invited a novelist to come to speak to a group of um, preachers a number of years ago, mm -hmm. and she said the key, um, the key to good novel writing, good storytelling, is concrete, significant detail, or concrete, significant detail, right? So if you have a lot of detail in the story, but it's not significant, it may be concrete, but you've diffused all my attention. It's like being trapped with that boring person at the party, and you're sort of, you try not to do this, but this is your body language, and it says, why are you telling me this, right? Mm -hmm. Which we don't, if anybody does that while you're preaching, it's just that they're cold, right? <laughs> but, uh, so it has to have significant detail, but it does have to be concrete enough mm -hmm. for me to enter in. It's not enough to say, um, this woman um, was a drug, a drug addict and then she spent a night in uh, Tarrant County Prison and had this experience of Jesus that completely changed her life. Everybody come down to the altar now. Give your life to Jesus, because I know you feel the emotion in that. No, not really. I don't, I don't, can't really, not enough there to step into it. So concrete, significant detail mm -hmm. uh, is something that, would mm -hmm. you agree with that? I, I mean, would definitely agree with that. I would also say, and this might be, you know, approaching from a different perspective, like, you know, craft is important, and we talked a little bit about that. Um, you know, faith is, is key, obviously, um, in telling stories. But I would also say, like, you know, doing your best to keep your, your, your vessel, your body, you know, open is a sacred temple, you mm -hmm. know. And, like, when me growing up, I, I, I saw some storytellers, whether they were rappers or poets or jazz musicians. I grew up with a lot of those guys and women. And, you know, you could see the effects of alcohol or drugs, you know, um, over time on someone, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I tell a lot of my students, even, like, smoking, like... You know, there's a, there's a period if you're a singer and you smoke, where you get a little sexy, like, you know, a little, little nice little mm -hmm. thing. But that doesn't last 40 years, you know what I mean? So, like, mm -hmm. like one of my favorite singers is Sam Cooke. He smoked, but he died at 36. If he would have lived to 55, I don't know if he would have been like, darling. I don't think he would have had that same, yeah. you know, it, it hollows you out. So I think something like that or just, I mean, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying ahead, to preach, you know. Pre you know preach. But just, you know, like, you know, like nutrition. So, you know, I used to be really overweight. Hmm. You know, as a kid, I was really overweight and stuff like that. And as I got older, some of the things I was trying to do with solo performances, I was trying to do six, seven shows a week, like that kind of like grandma's feet, but like, you know, 70, 80 minutes of different kind of things, traveling around, sometimes literally getting out of a bus or a train or a plane and going right to the venue and like sound checking and going. I couldn't do that if I was continuing to like have a really rough diet, you know. So I'm not telling someone to eat this or don't eat this, but sometimes that's really, really key, yeah. you know, to tell good stories. The lighter you could be. You know, like actually spiritually lighter and also physically lighter. Right. The, I think it's the easier, you, the cleaner you'll be to tell 
stories. Not that we right. have to be perfect, but I think right. that's something that we don't often talk about. We talk about the craft, which is true. Yeah, we don't. We don't talk about how um, the vessel. Difficult, you know what I mean? Difficult. I'm sure yours is difficult too. But preaching is tremendously taxing physically. I, w I have a smartwatch, and I don't wear it when I preach because I don't want to see what my blood pressure is. Yeah. Right? It's like woo. Uh, so um, Fred Craddock says, if you had a Stradivarius, would you leave it out in the rain? So if we think of ourselves as instruments of, of God's message, then the, uh, we ought to, I've been treating myself better as time has gone on, partly because I have no choice. Right, <laughs> right. And also, and also just think of, you know, on a, I guess kind of on a selfish thing, like I think of people who, you know, great storytellers that I never got a chance to see in person, I never got to work with or learn from because they passed away. Like in, mm -hmm. our, in our thing, like, like I'm working on this new piece with, uh, right now with Ben Vereen. It's like, wow, Ben Vereen. Oh, wow. Yeah. This is somebody I watched as a kid, you know, it's Ben yeah. Vereen. Uh, but there's a lot of people. the show? The show I used to watch. It, oh, he was a character oh, on the show. Oh, 10 Speed and Brown Shoe? That no, was it was a kid's show. Roots? Ben, ben Vereen. Was that? Remember all of them? Oh, okay, okay. Anybody remember that show? Oh, Reading Thank Rainbow. You. Oh, that's right. He was on yes. that. But, you know, this guy, I used to watch, you know, Roots when I was a little kid. I'm like, yeah, wow. So, he's amazing. And I'm learning stuff from him. And so I just think of all the people that I, you know, all the things that people who died, like August Wilson, who's a playwright, died at 60. You know, Richard Pryor, they died so young. Mm. And there's so much more they had to contribute to the world. And I was like, maybe I could have got with them and learned. But yeah, it's just gone. I mean, gone. It's gone. Yeah. So I think about that, too. Like, how do you sustain to try to be here, you know, 70s, right. 80s, and on, right. ideally. Right. We all got the vehicle. Right. Maybe some vehicles can go slower yeah, than other vehicles. That's right. You know that's what I mean? right. The other, a couple other things, then we need to open up to questions. Uh, I'll add a couple, and then you can jump in. Yeah. But um, one important thing about storytelling, I think, is to leave room for people to wonder things, leave mm -hmm. some gaps. There's a story uh, told by um, Theodore Parker Ferris, who was a pastor at Trinity Episcopal Church in Boston for years. And it's called The Man Behind the Pillar. That's what I've called it. And it's about, um, he was... Um, he was sitting in his office on a Monday morning, and this um, man came in and wanted to talk to him. So he sat down across from him at his desk, and he said, Dr. Ferris, I just want you to know that you saved my life last week. He said, well, I don't remember meeting you. He said, well, you didn't. He said, but I was on my way to the Charles River Sunday night with my pockets full of rocks. And I saw the lights, and I heard the music, and mm. I came in, and I uh, sat behind a pillar to avoid being seen, but I heard everything that you said, mm. and what you said saved my life, and I came to thank you. Now, do I need to explain why his pockets were full of rocks? Do I need to say, I've been terribly depressed for several years, my fiance just broke up with me, and I'm feeling very depressed? No. Right, no. So, it's very satisfying to figure something out. Does that make some sense? That's a really good point. Uh, and uh, so, leaving things out. The other thing is that one story can be used to make several different points. Uh, a friend told me the story of he, um, on a Saturday, he was uh, hoping to have a relaxing day and his wife came to him and said, the sink in the kitchen, it's not working, you need to fix it. So he comes over, he gets down on his hands and knees and gets under the sink and twists something and suddenly all this water spews out of the, the pipe. And he had what he called an adult tantrum, do you know what that is? That's, that's when you pretend to cry. It's like, <laughs> it's just really satisfying for a couple seconds. You can try it at home. Uh, and uh, he was just immersed in that. And he felt this little hand patting him. And he looked over, and it was his five-year-old daughter. And mm -hmm. she says, it's OK. You're a really good daddy. <laughs> now, you could use that to talk about the sensitivity of children. You could use it to point out that Sometimes it's good to have a little training before you attempt something. You can take it different directions, and what direction you take it depends on the details that you emphasize. So anything else on how to tell a story? Oh, no. how about talk about presence, being fully present. Yeah, I mean, we, we touched on that a little bit earlier, but I think, you know, like being in the moment. I have a hard time with that sometimes in life, but never when I'm telling stories. Right. I don't know why. You know? You're connecting with the audience? Yeah. What are you, what are you present to? The I'm present to itself? the energy you know, and to the moment, and just, I'm just here. And I never assumed, the, the couple of times I assumed I was going to be like, I got this, I, you know, I, the audience just kick. you know, it's like, you have to be humble with the energy. It's something that's bigger than all of us, you know what I mean? Yeah. And so you never... Never get so, cocky? So, yeah, so I, I get excited, even nervous, I'm talking to like, you know, 10 students at a library, it's like, Obviously, if it's more people, it might be a little more, but it's just like it's a, it's a humbling experience and, and it's, a, it's a sacred experience, so, you know, to be able to do this. So 
being present for all that. Yeah. yeah. And it's also the key to not having a blank mind. Um, and not what? Not having your mind go blank. Oh, right. If you're trying to speak without notes. So as soon as you start thinking, hey, I'm, this is going over so great, it's like, blotto. <laughs> right? <laughs> or as soon as you start thinking too far ahead, like, oh, what's coming next? Blotto. Yeah. So um, how about if we take some questions and then uh, we have a few things we want to say at the end about the power of story. So anybody have um, thoughts that popped into your head, moral, legal thoughts that popped into your head? As I was, as we were talking. Martin. Hmm. Hmm. Did everybody hear that? He wants to know if we can address the the ideas or the theories behind sequencing in making up a storyboard, like how to unfold a story. Okay. Do you have thoughts about that? Maybe me. Okay. Well, in terms of a sermon, can I talk about that? Uh, in terms of a sermon, the most effective, there are all kinds of ways to shape a sermon. And uh, the form, we would call it, of a sermon is basically the communication plan, <coughs> which is the, the sequence by which you unfold images, uh, stories, themes. And so in my experience, the best forms begin with the human condition and diagnose some aspect of it, and then move to uh, the character initiative of God, and then move to the difference that it makes in our lives. So it's, it's not very often, except maybe during Lent, where you would start out with, here's the good news. What about it don't you get? Go home and think about it. That's not really that compelling, is it? Yeah, usually we want to uh, move from human condition to divine character. But a lot of times what we do, this is an error in sequencing, is we offer the good news, and then we... we um, I guess we decide to ourselves, like the teacher ease takes over and we decide that maybe they didn't quite get it. So then we revert to describing the human condition again. And as I mentioned in the workshop uh, earlier, that's what I call the backing over the spikes ending. Like you when I return a rental car, I'm always very tired at the end of a trip and I have this weird little thought like, I wonder if that's really true. You know, if you back over the spikes, I bet that's not true, but I haven't tried it yet. But it definitely deflates a sermon. I don't know if that helps. Our, 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 our um, foundation is the Ar uh, Aristotelian model, which is right. based on Aristotle. Aristotle is a, a Greek philosopher. He did not create it, mm -hmm. but he was the first one, or at least he's the one that we have, that, the oldest one that wrote it's it down. It's kind of primordial, isn't it? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. This, what he, was, he even said his pr these principles go back since the beginning. We don't know where mm -hmm. it comes from. He even said so. He didn't create it, but he was one of the ones that earlier on put it down, at least that we have. And so it kind of talks about, I mean, we could talk about that forever, but basically it's like there's a protagonist, someone we're following, someone we establish an empathetic connection with. Not that we have to, like, love them, but we can understand where they, what they're trying to do or what they don't do. There's some faults there. They want something. They, they do a series of actions to try to get what they want. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of doing the, the shorthand here. Right. But, but and then basically at the end, they get what they, it's either the, the story ends on a positive or a negative or a positive negative, you know. So a positive negative is like they get what they want, you know, like they always wanted success and they get success, but then they're miserable. Or they always wanted money, they wanted to be rich, and they didn't get that, but they realized that their true friends are here, you know, that, or that kind of thing. Right, right. Um, there's a lot of other elements into it, but that's kind of like the basics of it. You don't have to stay with that model in theater or in like kind of secular storytelling, but in novels and movies and plays, that's the, like the foundation. So if you steer off that, like th that's what you call absurdism or experimental. You might have like a ho someone with a horse head just walk across the stage and then he never comes back. But you're doing <laughs> it to kind of push against the model. You know what I mean? So you don't have to do that model, but oftentimes it's good to know that for at the very least to have a conversation with people because that's the, that's the, that's the way we are hardwired as human beings. Right. Well, there's um, a textbook that probably many of you have seen called The Homiletical Plot by Eugene Lowry, and he basically modernizes Aristotle's uh, method. Mm. And his, his deal is um, there's an oops, which is the disequilibrium, everything's going along well, and then oops. And then there's an ug, it gets even worse. And then there's an aha, which is the, um, you bring in the scripture or some kind of uh, divine response that um, doesn't make it all better, but helps move toward a resolution. And then there, he made this up. I didn't. Okay, then it's oops, ug, aha, and this part, whee, <laughs> where you celebrate the positive uh, 
Right. So oops, agaha, we is sort and, of right, and that's that's it. something that I thought was which which is totally valid, interesting. Like I was doing a workshop with the, um, some preachers in Houston, and we were going through some of the, the finer points of this, and they were like, "Yeah, we can't. I don't feel comfortable doing like a a negative low ending on a huh. story." Right, right. You know what I mean? Right. Which is which I totally appreciate. But like right. in my field, you can do that. You can be like right. the person tries to get, and they just like. Ugh! And just then you just walk out. Everybody dead on the there, stage. Yeah, but there's, in, in, in the secular world, there's value to that. Right. But there may not be the same kind of, impo- it may, they right. might not be what you want to give someone on a Sunday. You know what I right. mean? Right, probably not. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, um, yeah. uh, we do want to, um, if, if we have this to the injustices and violence of the world, it's our job as preachers to make people aware, right? Or um, help people see what perhaps they wouldn't want to see. But on the other hand, uh, ultimately, we offer hope, and the church is to be the embodiment of hope in the world. Right. So um, there's right. probably a difference there. Yeah, yeah. In, in the secular world, we have that too as as an option, right. but it's not the on, it's not the only one. Right. Right. It's like a, it's like a cathartic. It's like you know Aristotle talks about catharsis. So right. if you go see a piece and it's horribly depressing, you're like, oh my God, I was just like you know, it's hopeless, hopeless. But somehow that identification right. supposedly leads to a not a healing, but a, like a. <sighs> A right. cleansing set. Now, whether it does right. or not, I don't know. But right. Any um, other questions or comments? My husband and I have tickets to the Windspear Theater okay. and the musicals. And you wouldn't think musicals would be depressing, right? But, um, and so we thought, oh, it would be great to invite Dean Hill and his wife, Robin, to go with us to a musical. And we, I didn't explore deeply about what the musical was. That's always good to take <laughs> people to something, you know. Just let's see. And it was called Fun Home. Maybe some of you saw it. it was, I found it riveting and deeply moving, but... It was a little depressing. So now we have to take them to some <laughs> romantic comedy or something to even the scale. See Annie or something. That's but it ended, it was, um, it was very, I found it very um, moving, right. but it was not uh, a happy ending kind right. of plot. Right. So I think there's room for, in, in preaching, I think we really need to um, respect the complexity of, of uh, human life and people's pain at the same time that we offer hope. So. It's a pretty tough job, isn't it, these days? So, story is more important than ever. Mm-hmm. So, yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. So how to make Thanksgiving a, um, an, ex- an opportunity to share the family story with grandchildren? Okay, okay. Well, our tradition when my dad was still living was to read Psalm 100. So the youngest child in the family who could read would stand up and read Psalm 100. So that was a, a mm. tradition that we try and keep alive. Um, that's an interesting question. How to, um, how to... The other thing that my dad liked for us to do is for everybody to go around and... Um, and share something we were thankful for. He also used to do that whenever we were fighting. He'd say, I want all of you children to go around and say something nice about each other. So I would start out by saying, I like his hair. (laughs) And then he would say, I like his hair. And it would just go around, and it would be not that helpful. But at at Thanksgiving, I think that tradition of going around and sharing something we're thankful for. Yeah, yeah, I was going to add to that. I think that, like, you know, some families are more open and tell more stories than others, you know. But I think there's something about um, charging the young ones to use their iPhones, the voice memo app on their iPhones, to go and sit down with grandma or grandpa and interview them. That's good. You yeah. know, like, and usually grandma and grandpa will be down. Not, sometimes they won't. But usually they'll, they'll be willing to talk. And one joy I've had over the last few years is I've made a conscious choice. Like I interviewed my father for like four, two times or two hours each oh. before he passed away. Oh, that's great. And I got so many stories, stuff that I kind of knew a little bit about but not the details. Or I interviewed my great uncle, like so many things. And there's a couple of people that I didn't get a chance to interview before they passed away. And I'm like, ah. You know, so I think you can make that a fun kind of game because a lot of times the grandparents are there and something might come up, but like sit them down, okay, what, what's the earliest thing you remember? What was it like there? You know, that kind yeah. of thing. And just make it a game and try to include the cell phone if they got or the eye touch because they got voice memo. So you can That's use your voice memo idea. and you can just record the whole thing. Yeah. So, so sharing, um, interviewing grandparents, sharing uh, scripture, 
saying what we're thankful for. Uh, this is interesting to me because I never thought about this in relation to my dad before he asked this question, but the other thing that he would do, unrelated to specifically Thanksgiving, is that whenever we would go visit them, when we would walk in, I'd walk in with my kids, and he would say, tell me something good about this boy. And he'd point to one of, one of the kids. We have three kids. Tell me something good about this girl. Tell me something good about this boy. And I could see the kids would perk up, and uh, it was just, it's like Thanksgiving for the positive. So I hope some of those help. That's a great That's question. Great. Any, anybody else have a question? Yeah. How preaching is more what? Uh, right, right, right. Oh. Okay, right. So how are you asking how we cultivate that in preaching? How you cultivate the rhythm. The rhythm in preaching. So I would say if if possible, if if you can perform the scripture, I think that can be really helpful. And even with a lot of scripture has movement to it, like I did earlier today, Philippians two, which is basically down and up. Uh, and uh, intentional movement in preaching. And uh, that's one reason that I um, many years ago got out from behind the pulpit mm -hmm. because uh, to me uh, the word usually used is delivery but I think embodiment is a better so if you can actually you know preach with your whole body mm -hmm. and if you're um, if you're talking about um, you know Jesus is turning toward the cross and now we need to follow him so closely that we step on the back of his sandals so walk mm -hmm. um, I don't know if this is answering your question but put your whole body into it. Mm -hmm. I, d I think those of you who, anybody agree with that? I mean, it's more, more um, joyful, right, for me anyway. Mm -hmm. well, I started preaching without notes because one time after I preached, a woman came up to me and she said, oh, your voice is so soothing. She said, if you weren't a preacher, you could be a hypnotist. <laughs> it's like, yeah. And I began to suspect that maybe I already was, so. But the way that you use dance, and I think you could do Michael Jackson. Yeah, uh, maybe so. Maybe so. <laughs> they gotta, they gotta hire me to. Play yeah. Do the you part. have any thoughts about about that? Ev everything is rhythm, to me. Everything is rhythm. So when you write, you're writing in rhythm too. Right. You know, I don't mean rhythm like jazz or a specific kind of music. It's all rhythm. The call and response that you talk about in African American culture, you hear it in the birds. I was over at Central Market the other day. You know those birds yeah, come there? Yeah, they're crazy. Those That's birds. crazy. I don't know what they're doing. It's like thousands of birds over there. Like anyway, Alfred like, Hitchcock. Gah, gah, gah. it's like it's all a conversation. You know, um, clearly there was a lot of music in my community growing up, like everywhere. It was always music, so right. I grew up in that. But you, to translate, I, I, I just agree with what she's saying. Just get in touch with your whole body. That's why, again, yoga, I know it sounds crazy, but yoga, stretching, right. breath exercise, all that stuff to get. So then the rhythms that you already have embedded in the, in the text, you can just bring naturally to the forefront. And also, like, rehearsing, you know, like practicing. Like, if, I don't do a lot of acting anymore, but when I do, you know, I rehearse a lot. I rehearse a piece 50 different ways, you know what I mean? So that way okay. I have it so loose I can do it any way depending on how I feel in the moment. In yeah. The I don't practice. So don't, maybe don't practice the text like a lock. I'm going to go like this and go like that. You know, just keep it open. Then you can be more open in the moment about right. in terms of how you want to deliver it. Right. So can we have one more minute? One quick minute. Okay. So uh, the last thing that we wanted to say was uh, that, that um, there's power in story and there's mystery in story. So um, oftentimes you experience as a preacher, someone goes out at the door at the back and thanks you for something that you didn't say. So, mm -hmm. uh, so we want to end. Will you tell them the Marine story and then we'll take it home? Oh, you want to end quick, with that one? Just real quick. That's not a rhythm one, but yeah. No, just real quick. So, so uh, okay, I'll tell that story. Um, I was, uh, this is when I was really coming up. I was about 20 years old and I was in a hip-hop group. We were trying to like make it and it was really, really hard. And we got our first real uh, gig it was at a, an army base in the Bay Area, in Vallejo, or way out somewhere in the Bay Area. And we got this, this gig, and we were getting paid like, I don't know, $500, which was a lot of money back then. We were like, $500, it's crazy. We'll split it up amongst ourselves. And, um, and so we got there, but it just so happens that between the time we did the contract and the actual show, they had announced the, uh, the Gulf War was going to happen. So it's like 1991. And these Marines didn't, we had our little, you know, positive, you know, conscious rap. They didn't want to hear that stuff. 
They want to see some, like, you know, women shake. They, 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 they were like, we're about to go to war. We, we don't want to see all this stuff. So we came on, we started to perform, and every song that we did, it just got progressively worse. Like, you know, they, a couple of booze here, someone threw something there. You know, we got to the last song. We're like, this is our last song. People started clapping. <laughs> and it was a real hostile crowd. Like, these guys were like, some of them were drunk. They were angry. They were young, which I'm not saying young is a bad thing, but they were like 18, 19. And they, had been, they were going to go off to war soon. So it was a real tough type situation. But two things I was telling Alice when we got, when we, when we finished, um, I was like, wow, we actually finished that show without getting beat up, you know? without getting attacked. Like, it was close. Like, they were like, but it didn't, they didn't rush the stage. It was some power beyond us that kept us kind of semi-safe. And I've had, I've had a few, I did a lot, of, I used to do a lot of shows at nightclubs and stuff. So I had a few of those, those things. But the, there was a certain power there that kind of kept it where it didn't, didn't get violent. You know what I mean? So we were able to finish. And I was like, wow, we can, we, if we can finish this, we can do anything. So it was like a real vote of confidence that we gained, even though the show was horribly rough with that audience. And then we left. We went backstage. It was like a little makeshift cafeteria, like behind the curtain. And this one guy, this one Marine ran backstage. He was like, that was the greatest show I ever saw. It was like, <laughs> it was like oh, my God, everything you talked about, I, I saw you. I know what you mean. And it was like this one guy that really connected to what we were saying, you know. And I was like, wow, we connected with one person. And there was a... Big, again, I, I, not to be all corny, but there's a bigger energy there. You know, to me, it's about the joy and it's the mystery. There's something going on between the audience and the preacher or the performer. But there's a third part that's bigger. You can call it God. You can call it the creative spirit, whatever, that's bigger. And the more you can just trust in that, the more you'll be okay. And there's definitely a couple of times like that time that it not only got us out of a place artistically, but physically, <laughs> we, we were able to get out before it got crazy. So Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you all. You've been a wonderful audience. Thank you. Thank you so much.